it quickly became untenable. The UK government had stood by its ambassador to Washington, but less than 24 hours after Donald Trump branded Kim Darek wacky and a pompous fool, and the latter found himself uninvited to a White House banquet, it was time to throw in the towel. Now, it all started when the Mail on Sunday published leaked diplomatic cables in which Derek described Trump as radiating insecurity and his administration as diplomatically clumsy and inept. What does his quick demise say about that special relationship between the U.S. and the U.K.? And where does it leave Britain standing on the world stage just as it's divorcing from the European Union? The opposition Labour Party already accusing Boris Johnson of becoming a potential, quote, patsy to Trump should Johnson win the Conservative Party leadership contest and become the next UK prime minister. We'll ask our panel if it's in the bag for Boris and whether to meet a Halloween Brexit deadline, he can last without triggering a snap general election or attempting a shutdown of parliament. We'll search Tuesday's one and only candidates uh, debate with challenger Jeremy Hunt for clues as to which way Britain is indeed headed. Today in the France 24 debate, well, we're waiting for Boris in all likelihood and joining us from London, Stephen Canning, former leader of the Young Conservatives. Thank you for joining us. Thank you for having me. Georgina Wright is senior researcher at the Institute for Government. Welcome to the show. Thank you. We welcome back Duncan Fairgreave, who teaches comparative law at uh, the University of Paris, Dauphine. Good evening. And France 24's very own Philip Turrell is with us. How are you, sir? I'm fine. Thank you, France 4. Good evening. The France 24 debate on Facebook and Twitter. Hashtag F24 debate. Uh, Kim Darek had been the life of the party at DC Functions and a regular guest at the White House. In his resignation letter, he states that the current situation made it, quote, impossible for me to carry out my role as I would like. More from Emerald Maxwell. I think the reality was that in light of, uh, of the last few days, his ability to be effective was probably limited, so it's probably the right course. The White House echoing Sir Kim Darrick in his resignation letter, in which he said the current circumstances had made his position as UK ambassador to the US untenable. Pressure had been mounting on Darrick since the leak of highly critical diplomatic cables where he described Donald Trump's administration as inept, insecure and incompetent. Trump lashed back with a tirade of tweets, calling Derek a very stupid guy, a pompous fool, and concluding that his administration would no longer deal with the UK ambassador. Appearing before a parliamentary select committee, the head of the UK Foreign Office called this unprecedented. Do you know of any other occasion on which a, the head of state of a friendly government has refused to cooperate with any of Her Majesty's envoys? None. I have been in the Foreign Office for nearly 37 years, and this is the first time in my service. The UK Prime Minister said she greatly regretted that Darek had felt the need to resign, adding that officials had to be able to give full and frank advice. I want all our public servants to have the confidence to be able to do that. And I hope the House will reflect on the importance of defending our values and principles, particularly when they are under pressure. The leak of Derek's cables comes at a particularly unwelcome time for the UK, which is hoping for a free trade deal with the US after Brexit. Britain's likely next leader, Boris Johnson, has come under fire for not standing up to Trump. He declined several opportunities to back Derek, stressing instead the importance of the UK's relationship with the US. Uh, I want to begin, uh, Duncan Fairgreave, with uh, what, what we heard in that report from Theresa May during Prime Minister's question time, when uh, she says, I want the House to reflect on the importance of defending our values and principles, particularly when they're under pressure. So I'm saying, that's a dig at Boris Johnson, is it? Um, I think probably it is um, an indication that the government's line and the approach of Jeremy Hunt in the debate and as Kwasi's role as um, Foreign Secretary was not fully reflected in what Boris Johnson has said. Um, you saw in that clip just now, he had ample opportunity 
to say a similar word of support, and he declined to do that. Well, let's, hear, let's hear what Boris Johnson said after the, the resignation of Kim Darrick. Johnson, who, let's just remind our viewers, is the former foreign secretary. I just, I just heard that uh, Kim Darrick resigned, and I want to say that I regret that, really, because I think he was a superb, is a superb diplomat, and I worked with him for, for many years. And I think that whoever leaked his diptels really uh, has done a grave disservice to uh, our civil servants, uh, to people who give impartial advice to ministers. And I hope that whoever did it is, is run down, caught and, and eviscerated, quite frankly, because uh, it, is, it is not right that advice to ministers that it, civil servants must be able to make in a spirit of freedom uh, should be leaked. So he's saying all the saying the right things there, right? After after the event, yeah. I mean that's the key point. He's saying that after. The, so I mean, you know, I mean that's. I mean the resignation has happened. So I mean, Sir Alan Duncan was on the World at One, BBC's World at One this this afternoon, and he said that Boris Johnson metaphorically threw um, the ambassador under a bus. You agree with that? Um. He's a senior member of the Conservative Party. He was Boris Johnson's self-proclaimed pooper scooper. Uh, when <laughs> Boris Johnson's foreign secretary, he knows him very well. Um, for someone like him to say that, I think, is an indication, I'm afraid, of the difficult situation we're in and, uh, and the inadequacy of what um, someone who could be the future foreign minister said last night. Stephen Canning, during that one-on-one -on -one debate on Tuesday... Uh, Boris Johnson uh, talking about a good relationship with the, saying with the United States was of fantastic importance. Uh, do you agree with Duncan Fairgrieve? I think Boris is completely right that, that you know a good relationship is incredibly important, and that's why you know clearly the now former ambassador is the victim in all of this. You know the he was doing his job; he shouldn't have to have left it, but the position was had become untenable and. But and, did you know, Boris Johnson throw him Boris under the bus? To... Well, I think Boris was in a very difficult position there because, you know, it is easy for people to have stood up and said, no, we want to keep him in place, we want him there, we want to fail him. But at the end of the day, his position has now been untenable, through no fault of his own, but his position is untenable. If the host nation will not meet you, will not see you, there is no use to you being in that role anymore. So as sad as it is and as terrible as it is, his position is untenable and, and he did need to resign and, and it's impressive it shows the character of the man that he took that decision himself and took it so quickly. Georgina Wright you agree? Um, I mean absolutely I think the ambassador's position is one to represent government abroad obviously but it's also to build strong links with with those people who are hosting you know it's not just about having strong links with um, particular government departments and you know businesses and interest groups it's also crucially about having those strong links with the White House and clearly in Sir Kim's resignation letter there was this sense that that his position had become untenable and that he wasn't able to really deliver um, his job in the way that he would like um, that being said, is it a dent in the special relationship? I mean, this UK-US special relationship goes back a long way. Um, there are lots of issues at stake, but I think the key question now is who will replace Sir Kim? Because they will be required to not only have a good understanding of what's going on in the United States and obviously the relationship with the UK, but also be able to explain the complexities of Brexit and what's going on in the UK and kind of highlight those opportunities for future UK-US cooperation. And finding someone who is able to play that role in the matter of weeks is going to be a key challenge. Uh, whoever it is, uh, uh, ringing is uh, the, a quote, it was in the Financial Times this uh, Wednesday, of an unnamed uh, senior diplomat saying, quote, I'm not sure Kim has a sword, but if he did, he wouldn't fall on it. What a terrible precedent that would set. Uh, Georgina, he's, he's fallen on his sword. So what kind of a precedent does it set? 
I mean, you know, it's very difficult to say I'm sort of basing what I know on, on Sir Kim's resignation letter and the response that he's received from government. Clearly, he felt that he was in a situation where he couldn't carry out his duties in the way that he would like and therefore thought it was more important for him to resign at this point. He also, um, you know, says very clearly that he, he his posting was coming to an end at the end of the year anyway. So presumably there have been talks within government about who is going to replace him. But the real thing, I, I think, is not so much the leaks themselves it, it's the fact that or rather the content of the leaks is it's the leaks themselves how do you know diplomats at this point feel can they carry out their responsibilities can they do that role of really sort of uh, you know telling um, uh, London and government how things are and, and will they feel free and, and transparent and able to do that um, without that information being leaked and ultimately damaging those very important political relationships well, we know ever since uh, th those U.S. diplomatic cables were leaked by WikiLeaks uh, a few years back that uh, there always is that risk now in the, in the world that, that we live in, Phil Turrell. Again, it brings up the question of who leaked those cables. Well, that, that's the first question. There is a police inquiry taking place as we speak into how those cables were leaked and how they were sent to the Mail on Sunday. Uh, there is a link uh, between the journalist who revealed them and uh, the Brexit party of Nigel Farage, uh, of which she is a supporter. Uh, questions are being asked about whether there is a possible link there. But what has absolutely changed in this situation, and that is something which is a much more worrying development, is that we've had these leaks in the past... It's not the first time cables have been leaked, not the first time diplomats have been called out saying something that wasn't meant for the ears of the people they were saying it about, but for diplomatic relations between the two countries. Um, but in those days, people used to just turn a blind eye to it or a deaf ear and not take any notice because that's what diplomats did. And diplomats in the United States did the same thing concerning the United Kingdom. What's happened this time round is that we have the President of the United States, Donald Trump, who is intervening personally in a very personal manner with personal insults towards an ambassador there who is sent from the United Kingdom. And, and that the ambassador and the then way... resigns... Mm. And then it says, OK, well, now it's the United States president who decides whether or not he wants to deal with an ambassador in that country. So it's not only worrying for the ambassadors who are on postings in the United States, but I think also worrying for the ambassadors from the United States who are elsewhere, because they're saying, well, are we going to be able to do our job properly in the future? And if we're not, what is our job going to be? And what role will the president of the United States play in dealing with all of this and interfering in what shouldn't be anything to do with him. Stephen Canning, you agree? Yeah, I, I, I think, it, you know, there is the real chance of a, of, a, of a terrifying president here that, you know, countries can believe that they can veto our ambassadors. And again, this isn't, I still think it was completely right. And, you know, he had no choice. He had to step down and resign. But it, it, there is a real risk now that we do create a situation uh, where countries feel like they can veto who we send out as an ambassador. I suppose his situation potentially can be viewed as perhaps a unique one in that his uh, tenure was coming to an end anyway, he was moving on anyway, and, and, and hopefully that's how it will be viewed, rather than sending the message that you know, the United Kingdom is willing to allow other countries to pick its diplomats. All right, you, you mentioned Philip Turrell, uh, Nigel Farage. Donald Trump once called uh, for him to become uh, the uh, UK ambassador to Washington while well, Derek was already uh, the, uh, in his posting there. The Brexit Party leader putting out a tweet uh, this Wednesday calling Derek's resignation the right decision uh, put in a non put in a non remainer who wants a trade deal with but, America. But that what? is exactly what Nigel Farage would say because one of the reasons and one of the suspicions behind this affair is that uh, Sir Kim was not pro Brexit enough in his dealings with the United States authorities. Now you have to remember that Britain is due to leave the EU on the thirty first of October and. That means it's going to be leaving 
its largest trading partner, which is the European Union. So it's keen to strike deals elsewhere, notably with the United States. So people are saying, well, look, Sir Kim's not doing his job correctly. We need a pro-Brexit guy in Washington who's going to be efficient and move forward. Uh, why don't we put Nigel Farage there? But Farage has now said that he doesn't want that job because I think he, he would have been embarrassing he, for the Brexit He wouldn't party, be appointed be anyway. But, but, but Duncan Fairgrieve, though, the question is, is the next UK ambassador to the US going to have to approve his pro-Brexit credentials? Yeah, I mean, I think I, mean, I think this opens up now to all sorts of issues. He's going to have to. If he's going to have the approval by the administration in the U.S., are they going to pull the plug on him or her again if they don't if they don't like what they hear? I totally agree with with Philip's analysis, and and the key issue is the the the, the lack of absolute full support across the board from the government for Sir Kim, I think, is, 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 is problematic. And I think civil servants will feel uh, aggrieved at what has occurred. Um, I think what is absolutely clear is there'll have to be another professional diplomat appointed. I mean, some of the ambassador roles are open to open competition, so that could be outside appointment. But I think it would be absolutely terrible if it was, I mean, alone, <laughs> Nigel Farage, um, but a, a, a non diplomat was appointed. I think they, they needs now to, a point needs to be made um, and a professional uh, diplomat appointed. A career, not civil one, a career civil servant and not one that is uh, pro-Brexit or anti-Brexit, but it's just someone who's actually good at their job, as I think Sir Kim um, was as well, and is able to represent the UK um, properly without interference. The special relationship. Outside. Uh, you, you, you think back to, you know, there's been crises in the past between the US and the UK. We think most notably of uh, well, the Suez well, the Canal S crisis in the 1950s. That is true. Is this worse? This is this is different. This is this is as bad, this blow if not over, worse, right? but certainly different. And what's the difference? The difference is that in the Suez crisis, there was a row over the fact that Britain and France went in to stop Egypt from nationalising the Suez Canal. And the United States intervened and said, you can't do that, and if you don't get out, then we're going to cut off your IMS funds. So that Britain came out of that, and it sort of lost all its credibility as being a world power as a result of the Suez crisis. But it wasn't a personal attack against uh, the, the rulers in the UK at the time. What we've got here, there have always been ups and downs in this special relationship. Remember that the, uh, between Margaret Thatcher uh, and Ronald Reagan, it was like a honeymoon. Uh, it was the same between uh, 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 Tony Blair and uh, Bill Clinton, and then later on with George W. Bush. Remember the Iraq war yes, uh, that he went uh, hand in hand with, uh, with, uh, with uh, George W. Bush. But it wasn't quite so nice between uh, uh, the, the leaders of the time in the 1960s when uh, uh, they tried to get Britain to support the Vietnam War and the British Prime Minister Harold Wilson wouldn't do that. So there have been ups and downs, but it's always been on a political basis. There's never been an up and down on a fact, you're a hopeless bit of, uh, of diplomat, you are a pompous fool, uh, you did a really bad job on, on, on the Brexit uh, 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 negotiations because you didn't listen to me being Donald Trump. Mm. It's become much more personal now, and there we're on new ground that in all the years that this relationship has happened since the end of the Second World War, how, we been how the next UK Prime Minister, and it'll probably be Boris Johnson, handles the President of the United States. We'll ask our panel when we come back. You're watching the France 24 debate. Welcome back or welcome if you're just joining us. It's the France 24 debate and we're speaking on the uh, wake of the uh, UK ambassador to Washington's resignation and ahead of the Tory party's pick of a new leader. With us uh, from London, Stephen Canning, former leader of the Young Conservatives. Welcome back as well to Georgina Wright, senior researcher at the Institute uh, for Government. We're also joined by uh, Duncan Fairgrieve, who teaches comparative law at the University of Paris, Dauphine, and by France 24's uh, Philip uh, Churl. Stephen, uh, I'm, we were looking at the calendar here. Um, it's a tight schedule coming up, 23rd of July, last Prime Minister's question time for Theresa May. By then, we know who the winner is for that uh, Conservative Party leadership contest. Uh, is it up to Theresa May to name the next UK ambassador to Washington? Um, so, I, I, I mean, I believe technically it's prob probably with, uh, I, within her gift to name the next ambassador. I'd also assume, uh, as has been mentioned, that 
given uh, Kim was leaving anyway at the end of this year, that conversations have already been held. I'd assume there's already potentially a shortlist of candidates that could fulfil this role. Uh, and these aren't the sort of things that people really rush into at the last minute. Um, I personally think it would be better for the Prime Minister to, to leave it and wait for the new uh, Prime Minister, whoever that may be, uh, to take over. It seems like it would be a much smarter choice to allow Boris or Jeremy to make the pick. Uh, but we'll have to see what she does. Um, I, my, my gut instinct is that she will not make the appointment. Georgina Wright, you agree? Yeah, so procedurally, there, there is kind of a way that you appoint um, ambassadors, and particularly to very important positions, such as, you know, our embassy in, in, in Washington. Um, so you would have the Foreign Office, a panel, generally a board, who would select candidates. Um, I, you know, my understanding as well is probably they have been thinking about this. So Kim was due to resign or also change the post um, at the end of the year. So they probably do have a short list. I agree with that. Um, and then they are formally appointed uh, by sort of that proposed by the Prime Minister and then formally appointed by the Queen. Um, so it can happen very quickly, um, but I think there is a political question for, uh, you know, Theresa May being, well, I'm on my way out. Should I just leave? This is obviously a very, very important position. Um, perhaps it should be up to my successor to nominate them. All right. We, we saw, we were discussing about it in part one of our discussion uh, Boris Johnson, did he support Kim Derrick enough at Tuesday's Tory leadership debate broadcast by ITV? He seemed to hedge his bets on the ambassador. Uh, his rival, Jeremy Hunt, accusing him of the word we're hearing a lot these days in the UK, equivocating and equivocating on lots of issues. Naomi Lloyd has more. One of these two men will be the next Conservative leader and British Prime Minister. In their first head-to-head -head debate in front of a live TV audience, Jeremy Hunt and Boris Johnson took questions from members of the public. Top of the agenda was Brexit, with both men competing to show that they would get a deal with the EU before the end of October. If you don't get us out of the EU by the 31st of October, will you resign? We're going to come out on October the 31st. And I think anybody who goes into this negotiating and uh, negotiation proposing yet again to kick the can down the road will, I think, run the risk of forfeiting trust with the electorate and also undermining our no negotiating position in Brussels. Could you answer yeah. Mr Hunt's question? De delay does not deliver a deal. Julia, a deadline <laughs> will deliver a deal. And we I, must I, stick to that deadline. I think it's a no. When asked whether they would suspend Parliament to force through a no-deal Brexit, the two men had different positions. I think it would be a rather curious thing to do if this is about taking back control for Parliament to actually shut it down. So my answer to that is no. How about you, Boris? Well, I'm not going to take anything off the table any more than I'm going to take ah, no deal so no answer. off the table. Then the row over the UK ambassador and his leaked emails about the Trump administration. Hunt, the current foreign secretary, criticised the US president's response. I think his comments about Theresa May were unacceptable and I don't think he should have made them. Johnson, a former foreign secretary, refused to be drawn on any criticism of Trump and dodged the question over whether he would keep the ambassador. I will keep him until he's due to retire, okay. um, and I think we'd like to know if you would. Well, I, I'm not going to be so presumptuous as oh. to... As Thank to you. Okay. Going to be in a position. The choice of Britain's next Prime Minister will be made by Conservative Party members. They've begun voting already, and the result is due on the 23rd of July. So, Duncan Fairgrave, what did you make of that debate? I mean, I, I, it wasn't the liveliest of, of contests. I mean, uh, uh, Boris uh, Johnson illustrated his talent for avoiding questions and, and not giving clear answers. I thought Jeremy Hunt was actually quite, um, quite dynamic, quite robust in the way he questioned, cross-examined, actually, um, at, at certain occasions, um, Boris Johnson. Um, but the fallout, of course, has been on, all on the ambassadorial question, I think. But there, there were a lot of other issues which were broached. Yeah, um, including that issue of suspending Parliament. The former Prime Minister, John Major, uh, this Wednesday saying he would sue if that was done. Is, would, a, would a Prime Minister Johnson really suspend Parliament? I mean, I, I, I hope not. I'd like to say no to you, but, I mean, he has uh, unfortunately <laughs> he's been given ample opportunity 
as on the ambassadorial question, given ample opportunity to uh, say he would not use the prorogation, and he has refused to do that. And Dominic Raab, uh, who prominent pro-Brexiter, previous um, uh, uh, part of the, the leadership campaign, one of the uh, uh, candidates who has joined Boris Johnson, has taken a different view. He's been um, in favour of that. Um, so um, we, I, we, it's, it's, very, it's very unclear. Personally, I think that it is very unlikely to happen because it would be clearly a constitutional crisis. And I think also a huge political um, uh, difficulty as well, because one of the big arguments of the Bre pro-Brexiters uh, was to, to bring powers back to Parliament from, uh, from uh, the European Parliament. So for then to turn the tables and actually use a technique to prevent Parliament from inter interfering in, in the process and, and movement to a no deal would be hugely paradoxical. Yeah, because this would be suspending Parliament, just to remind our viewers, would be uh, to prevent uh, Parliament from forbidding a no-deal uh, Brexit. Uh, Stephen Canning, do, do you agree with Duncan Fairgreave, even though Boris Johnson wouldn't give a firm answer that he would not suspend Parliament? I think, I think uh, you know, suspending Parliament is very unlikely. I think the likelihood of Boris actually doing it is slim, slim to none. Um, the same as I think the idea of us leaving on no deal is slim to none. But I do see, um, I can see strength in Boris's position in refusing to take these things off the table. And, you know, where our negotiations have lacked for some time is that we have cornered ourselves into boxes by drawing red lines by removing options from the table. And, and Boris has made it clear he's not willing to do that. He's going to go into this negotiation with every option there and every option at his disposal. And he will do what he needs to do to make sure the UK leaves by the 31st of October with the best deal possible. Do you agree with that, uh, Philip Uh I sort of agree with it, but I just find totally scandalous that anybody running for the premiership of the United Kingdom could even, could even entertain the idea of proroguing Parliament to pass through legislation that lots of MPs in the House of Commons know is going to be detrimental to the economy of the United Kingdom. And to actually say, well, I'm going to prorogue Parliament, which means I'm going to bypass Parliament to pass this through, is like an affront against democracy. And the Queen has to sign that off as well. And that's bringing the Queen into the debate as well as giving her assent for the, the Prime Minister to prorogue Parliament to get the legislation through that he wants. And we haven't seen anything like that in the United Kingdom since the 1660s and Charles II. And it didn't work out very well for him either then. So Yeah, there was actually, a civil war. <laughs> but if, exactly. But if, we, if, we're gonna, if they're going to start thinking about doing that now, then what does that say about democracy in the United Kingdom? So if he doesn't do it, Boris Johnson, we're getting a new Prime Minister on the 23rd of July. He's going to fill it in the same, find himself in the same spot as Theresa May, just stand there where she was with the same divisions in the Conservative Party, with Jeremy Corbyn and the Labour Party standing across from the dispatch box. And the problem is going to be the same. There's a huge division over pro-Brexit, anti-Brexit, soft Brexit, hard Brexit within the Conservative Party. How is... Boris Johnson or Jeremy Hunt, for that matter, going to manage to bring the, that party together to get some legislation through in only three months or four months when Theresa May's been at it for three years and hasn't managed to do it. I still don't understand how they're going to manage it. So to say that I'm going to prorogue Parliament to get that through is already a telltale sign to me that Boris Johnson knows it's a more or less impossible thing to do by the 31st of October. Well, I have good news. Georgina Wright knows and she's going to tell us right now. How do you do it in three months? No, well, that's an excellent question. Lots of people are asking themselves. Just to come back very briefly to proroguing Parliament, so it effectively means suspending Parliament. That actually happens every year, right? What, what happens is Parliament is suspended, but then it's recalled two weeks later. There's a new Queen's speech which sets out the agenda for the year, um, and then you know parliamentary a new a new kind of session will begin and things pick up um, as normal. So that is not new. I think what MPs are worried about is that. A new Prime Minister, say Boris Johnson, uh, suspends Parliament and then doesn't recall MPs for a couple of weeks until that deadline, that famous Brexit deadline of the 31st of October takes place. Um, and I think then 
you come to the issue of, of no deal Brexit and how do you prevent it from happening? Well, effectively, the only way that you can stop a no deal from happening is either to pass a deal or to stop the process altogether to say, actually, the EU, we're not ready, we're just going to revoke Article 50, or you ask for an extension. Now, the question for whoever becomes Prime Minister and their team is, if they are really serious about renegotiating you know, a, a new deal or amending the deal that's on the table with the EU, they're going to have to act very quickly. That means that they're going to have to convince the EU that they've got alternatives, that actually these alternatives will be enough to get this deal through through Parliament, because the bloc, you know, so far hasn't been the inability to negotiate something with the EU, it has been the, the inability to pass what has been negotiated in the UK Parliament. So there are going to be lots of questions on the EU side as well, which is, okay, well, you know, if you want further talks, maybe we can have further talks, but what do you want to change and will it be enough? Will it be enough? Uh, and then there's a question that puzzles us on, on this side of the channel. These are crucial weeks and months ahead, Georgina. Uh, and yet, Parliament is due to break up for summer recess on July 25th. What do you think of that? Yeah, exactly. I mean, recess, uh, you know, MPs go off, um, uh, often take their holiday at that time as well. It's been, you know, quite a, quite a stressful and year. And they're sticking um, to their vacation. Stressful. But, um, well, so far, I mean, again, there could be a decision to kind of, um, you know, suspend recess and, and, and keep at it. But again, that would be a question for, for, the, new, uh, for the new government. So there, there, are, there is absolutely a question of whether this is all feasible, because can you effectively, before the 31st of October, go back to Brussels, find a new deal or, or tweak a deal, uh, have the debates in Parliament, make sure it passes, and then possibly adopt any domestic legislation that is necessary to adopt that deal. Because in on the UK side, it's not only about having an agreement with the EU, it's also about passing the domestic legislation to adopt that deal, to pass it into UK law. And there are serious questions about whether there is enough time to do all of that. Steve Canning, earlier in the conversation, you were convinced that... Uh there would be a deal and that there would be a Brexit. Um, so I, I'm, I'm quite confident um, that, uh, that there will be a deal. I think the Prime Minister's deal, though it fell, was not far away from passing. You know, it, it was nearly there. She nearly got it through and there are a few bits hanging up, like the uh, backstop. Um, and I think it's not unfeasible for the Prime Minister the new Prime Minister that takes over, to be able to renegotiate something new on the backstop or remove that part of the deal altogether and then get the support of uh, members of Parliament to get it through, especially as we see ourselves getting closer to October the 31st and this fear that Boris may well take the country out on no deal sticks in with some of the MPs and, and they sit there and they weigh up the option of would they rather back this deal or allow the country to leave on no deal. And I think, given that choice, an awful lot of parliamentarians may not suddenly make their mind up that they want to back the deal. Duncan Ferry. I just heard what Stephen said, but I mean, sometimes you wonder whether um, members of the Conservative are actually listening at all to what is being said to them by the other negotiating party. I mean, uh, the small matter of the backstop, says Stephen. I mean, it's small matter. I mean, uh, <laughs> that is a, a bit of an understatement. And, you, you know, I, the, the European Commission have been absolutely clear they're not going to They're not going to leave reopen. Ireland and go. They're not going to let Ireland go at all. And they're not going to reopen the negotiations. So what Stephen's just put to us is just cloud cuckoo land. Uh, Stephen, how do you uh, solve the backstop uh, issue? We've asked it so many times on this show. Mm. I, so I, I, I disagree. I don't think it is cloud cuckoo land. I think the thing with the Europeans and European Union, these sorts of negotiations, is actually... When it gets to the last minute, when you get to the final few months, there often is a bit of trading, a bit of uh, negotiation on the side, a bit of moving certain bits around. And I don't think it's impossible for the two sides to meet part way. I know the EU have said they won't carry it, they won't keep negotiating, but I think actually they would much prefer that the UK left on a deal than it left on no deal, much like many of the parliamentarians. And well, without putting I in peril the Good Friday how... Agreement. 
I still, I still disagree with this argument that, uh, that, 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 that the Good Friday Agreement will be put in peril. That there is solutions that can be found. We've already seen that the European Commission has been working on technological solutions to the Northern Ireland border, despite telling us throughout the year that they didn't exist and that they weren't ready. Um, you know, it's now become clear actually that the European Union has set up working groups to develop those and look at those. So there are options out there, and there are things that could be looked at. Um, and I think, you know. I'm not trying to downplay the importance of the border. I, uh, when I say small matter, I don't mean it's a small issue, but I, th I think it's a small problem to solve. Is that the, the, the two sides are not a million miles away on finding something that they can both agree on, and then this deal can get through. Duncan Ferguson. Which is what all sides want. Duncan. But I mean, again, I mean, this is this is this is the discourse we've had for the last three years from the Conservative Party, which seems to be, in essence, they're going to they're going to give in, they're going to give in at the last minute. That seems to be the strategy that is articulated, and yet that has not happened. That mm. didn't happen in the run up to the 31st of March. And there's also that the DUP. The, the DUP, you know, are breathing down everyone's neck as well. And so uh, the idea, and by the way, they, the Europeans are not close the door to negotiation. What the Europeans have said is that they're not going to renegotiate the withdrawal agreement, which was a product of long negotiation. They were willing to look at the political, political declaration. That, that is absolutely true. Um, the but they're not going, but, but the idea that somehow the last minute in smoke-filled rooms, that is just a, a hope. Right. And, and it's, uh, it's, it's, it's a terrible way to run a negotiation. A, a, a tough task awaits uh, the next UK prime minister. And Boris Johnson, as we've been talking about on the show, accused of equivocating in the interest of uh, fairness and balance here. It should be said that the leader of the opposition is also being accused of equivocating. He was asked by the BBC whether Labour was the party of leave or the party of remain. Tories want no deal. We will stop that. And we believe the public should have a vote to decide whether it should be no deal or remain in the EU. Okay, so for anyone looking in, is Labour now a party of remain or leave? Labour is a party which says we will take no deal off the table and the people will have a choice in the future as to whether they remain in the European Union or they accept what would be very, very damaging, no deal exit from the EU. Charles, did he answer the question? No, but neither did Boris Johnson either when he was asked several questions last night. And the thing about Labour is, and I think the whole tragedy of this whole Brexit debate, is that uh, the Labour Party has been unable to come up with a firm position, whether they are in favour or against Brexit, uh, throughout the last three years since he took office as Labour leader, Jeremy Corbyn has sat on the fence and has... Uh, confused the whole debate. So uh, those who are in favour of a hardline Brexit know that there is no real opposition opposite them from the Labour Party. And that is why I think we're in such a mess today, because uh, th there's been no strong opposition to the whole Brexit process from a strong Remainer party, apart from the Liberal Democrats, who are too small to have a real impact. Uh, and that's why uh, the, the situation has got so bad and there are so many divisions but uh, even in the Labour Party itself the party is completely divided like the Conservative Party over those who want to remain in the EU, in the EU and those who want to leave. Ge Georgina Wright what does this say about UK politics as a whole you can criticize Donald Trump but at least you know where he comes from and what he stands for why is there so much equivocating on both sides of the aisle? I mean, there are lots of people who think different things about this. Ultimately, um, you know, the referendum was incredibly divisive. Um, we have inherited from it. We have a divided government. We have a divided parliament and we have a divided country. Now, the problem really is to move beyond that division and think, well, what what outcome do we want? How can we move towards that outcome? How can we make sure that the EU kind of meets us halfway or, or, or share that vision? And how how can we make sure that people in the country also support that vision? I mean, it is an incredibly complicated task. And I think the new prime minister um, is going to face very much the same issues as, as Theresa May is really uh, that attempt to not only deliver on Brexit, but also unite uh, parliament and the country um, through that process. And of course, if we think this has been complicated, let's just wait until we start negotiating our future. Because I mean, at the moment, we're still talking about the withdrawal issues. We're talking about sort of the so-called divorce 
Morse bill. We're talking about, you know, what mm. happens to British citizens in the EU and vice versa. But we haven't really begun talking about what our trade relationships going to look like, how our security arrangements are going to work. And all of that is going to require a lot more sort of detail um, and, and regular discussions um, in, in the public and, you know, in Parliament. And so there is going to be a real challenge. Now, clearly, the new uh, sort of contenders for Prime Minister think that they are up to that challenge and that they will be ready to unite the country. Um, uh, I think for us, we, we just have to sit back and, and see. All right. We will see. We will talk about it. Georgina Wright, many thanks for joining us from London. I want to thank as well Stephen Canning for being with us from the UK capital. Duncan Fairgreen, Philip Turrell. Stay with us. Media Watch is next. And we say hello to James Creedon. Hi, Francois. A uh, quick look at how it's been playing out on uh, news websites and social media. Um, of course, uh, lots of chatter about uh, this whole uh, affair. Good talking, going back now, of course, to the um, resignation of Ambassador uh, Darok. Uh, this is uh, Financial Times uh, reporting on it. And one of uh, the reporters was kind of tweeting details from that article as well, saying that uh, the Foreign Office told the Financial Times that Sir Kim Darak watched uh, the debate last night between the two contenders for the Tory party leadership and, of course, the, for a prime minister. And kind of saw that the ne likely next Prime Minister, Boris Johnson, was willing to throw him under a bus, so to speak, and on, on that basis decided to bow out. So that's kind of what's been filtering through from quotes picked up by various uh, uh, journalists. This is David Lammy, uh, an um, MP for the Labour Party. Uh, a lot of outrage about uh, how all of this has played out. Hounded out of office for telling the truth. This is a disgraceful example of what taking back control, which I suppose could be the slogan for Brexit, mm. uh, it looks like, in other words, taking back control in, or, in order to be subjugated to what he calls uh, bigoted foreign leaders in the plural, but I suppose referring to uh, probably the US in this instance. Uh, uh, this is another comment. I have known Kim Rock for 25 years. Uh, this is uh, Charles uh, Grant of uh, the Centre for European Reform. He is uh, an exceptional public servant of great integrity who has always done his best to implement government policy. Faragists, in other words, pro, harsh pro-Brexiters, have won <laughs> this battle, uh, but not the war, uh, etc. Uh, this is a piece in The Guardian saying that Kim de Rock effectively, he was sacked by Johnson on the orders of Trump. This is how it's sort of being perceived by a lot of people mm. as uh, something that is uh, somewhat humiliating in, in, in many ways. Uh, others disagree with The Guardian's take on this. Uh, the Guardian, up to their usual bias, reporting the only person responsible for his resignation is the leaker hunt was wrong to say he supported him remaining in his position when his position was untenable so there is a debate uh, there are obviously other positions in regards to this this is leave.eu and you can see here how uh, uh, the ambassador is being cast as somebody who was a supporter of Hillary Clinton a uh, good riddance says this uh, this particular piece of uh, um, imagery doing the rounds of social media. Uh, so there is that point of view there as well. It's, it's, it's important to acknowledge that. Uh, Andy Wigmore, who is a, a part of the Leave.eu campaign, uh, he, he has been tweeting to Alistair Campbell, former spin doctor for uh, Tony Blair and others, basically saying that the civil service is full of dripping wet lefty civil activists, uh, of which he would include uh, uh, the for now former or soon to be former US ambassador. And that now with Boris Johnson imminently coming into power, we will drain the swamp. So some people uh, respond to that saying, "Are you, you know, this is Stephen uh, Doughty, I think that's correctly pronounced. He's a Welsh uh, Labour Party MP and he's upset by the use of the language there, uh, draining the swamp, which of course was Donald mm. Trump's uh, original term, which only goes to confirm that there might be a, a, a you know a culture that is being bridged there between uh, Donald Trump and uh, Boris Johnson uh, imminently coming in. This is the New Statesman, uh, uh, left-leaning uh, weekly. Uh, the Kim Darak affair will further diminish the British civil service and the point of view here being uh, of uh, Stephen Bush is that it could exacerbate a growing trend where civil servants feel they can't speak their minds mm -hmm. candidly. Uh, this tweet was dug up as well uh, by some, uh, in other words, uh, Trump uh, kind of, you know, behind the scenes getting what he wants. This is a tweet going back to 2016 where he thought that Nigel Farage would be an excellent British ambassador to the US. I mean, that's not imminently uh, on, on the cards or anything, but some, some saying that uh, by ousting, uh, by, by at least putting pressure on to get, uh, get rid of mm. the current ambassador, that it's going in the direction of what Trump would like to see. 
All right, this story is going to continue to run. Many thanks uh, for that. Uh, James Creed, and I want to thank our panel once again. Thank you for joining us here in the France 24 debate.